All right. So it says it's live. So I'm going to do a little intro now. Uh, hey, guys. This is Nick Horton, the Iron Samurai, and this is another interview with Weightlifting Academy. And today we are interviewing Diane Fu, way on the other side of the earth, or at least on the other side of America, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, so there she is. Say hi. Hey. How's it going, guys? <laughs> Hello. Um, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us a quick, you know, one minute, two minute elevator, uh, you know, pitch, and tell the world who you are in case they live under a rock and they don't know who you are. Right? All right. Uh, my name is Diane Fu. I am a strength and conditioning coach at San Francisco CrossFit. Um, I also own and operate uh, Fu Barbell Club, which is our Olympic style weightlifting club, and also a concept um, out of San Francisco CrossFit. Um, I kind of straddle both worlds. I don't really belong in one or the other, but kind of have my feet in both. So I hang out with the CrossFitters, and you know they're my community. And I also hang out with the weightlifters, and they're my community. So it's kind of where I came from. Awesome, awesome. So uh, you gave me so you gave two basic right there. Can you explain each one a little bit? and why they're different and how they're the same and why it is that you can have one foot in one and one foot in the other and not have that somehow split you in two? Well, here's the thing is, you know, I, so maybe this should go back a little bit more of like how I got started into everything. Um, I've been involved with CrossFit since about 2005, 2006 and, you know, it was somewhere in that journey of being involved in CrossFit, coaching CrossFit, you realize that if you really wanted to advance in this one sport, this one category, you have to start really refining your skills in all these different avenues that we try to chase down. Yeah. So I started seeking out specialists at that point for everything from gymnastics to uh, rowing to running experts to my very first formal uh, Olympic weightlifting coach, Jim Schmitz. And you know what ended up happening was being involved in all these different categories, you never really get to become truly specialized in any one. And Jim, being the great coach that he is, kind of let me flail and do my own thing in the beginning, having my hands in so many different pots. And it was at that point where he goes, hey, look, if you really want to become good at weightlifting, you need to become a weightlifter. Like, you need to focus your time and energy in this one activity. And I was a good athlete. I'm like, yes, coach, you know, I'm in. So I kind of put everything else aside, and I jumped two feet in and, uh, you know, had a, had a, you know, pretty successful weightlifting career in a very short amount of time. And you know, was able to get up and start participating on a national level, but it was, you know, when I got up to that national level that I realized that, you know, my extent, given my age and how late I started, would be completely just participatory. <laughs> <laughs> I can completely so, with you. <laughs> and so um, I was still coaching CrossFit at the time, and I had started getting a little more involved in just the Olympic weightlifting side of coaching CrossFit. Yeah. And it was, you know, then I started to realize that, you know, a lot of these CrossFit athletes that I was working with, you know, a lot of them didn't really want to become weightlifters, but they really wanted to become good at weightlifting. And so, you know, the, the message that I, you know, I didn't have enough data back then. You know, it was just me kind of figuring out. I was still an athlete. I was trying to straddle and become a coach. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I didn't have enough information, but I'm like, you know, I don't know if I really believe that. And it took me a few years up until, you know, a year or two ago where I started seeing athletes around me like, you know, high, you know, high level CrossFit athletes actually become pretty decent at weightlifting, CrossFitting on a full time schedule. And in fact, I can use one of our own coaches. She's standing in front of me right now, Courtney Walker. Uh, last, just two weeks ago, she weighs in at about, you know, 50 somewhere between 53, 58 kilo body weight, and I watched her PR her snatch at 72 kilos, and also hang clean and jerk uh, 95, and that's pretty amazing crossfitting yeah. on a full-time schedule. Absolutely. I guess that's a really roundabout way to answering, like, you know, how I can kind of hang out in both worlds is because I believe you can have it all. <laughs> Maybe that's just the hopeful side of me, right? But I really believe that, you know, athletes that want to become better weightlifters for CrossFit can do that. And I love the weightlifting world because, you know, let's let's be honest, there's nothing more, 
you know, fantastic, artistic, sexy, appealing than being able to manipulate a barbell. My opinion. Yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to, to agree with you. I'm trying to inclined to agree with you actually on a lot of fronts there, especially the uh, more is better aspect, which I yeah. uh, I tend to promote. <laughs> yes, yes, you're you're very Bulgarian in your nature. I, I do like that. I more very much agree with what you're saying that like the 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 issue is rarely that you're doing too much and you need to pull shit back. Why? Right. You're just not enough yet. Like you, like, yeah, correct. Sunday I agree. Really I agree. Does that make sense? Like, you're not, like, um, so Sorry. on that, you, uh, as you said, you, uh, you're into barbells. You find barbells beautiful, not just because they both start with the letter B, but the <laughs> is true. Yes. <laughs> and the, you even named your, uh, your, your, your concept, who barbell. So I'm gonna take a wild guess here and say you like barbells. I do like barbells. And uh, so I, I want to know what it is that makes. So I, I we know a CrossFit. Right. What makes Foo Barbell different than what you're doing with the CrossFitter? So what are you doing with Foo Barbell that's different than what's going on with the CrossFit side? Well, hopefully I'm sending a message that isn't dogmatic. You know, I don't believe there's one style. I don't believe there's one way. You know, I've made it a point my entire career to spend as much time supporting and learning and uh, being as open-minded as I could to all the different coaches that are, you know, have a name. You know, I truly believe I follow a lot of these coaches, I read their material, I attend their seminars, I listen to what they have to say, and every coach that I've come across, even if they are, you know, in difference with each other, they are all trying to put their best foot forward. No one's out there trying to feed people crap. You know what I mean? Like all these coaches have a genuine passion to help. And, you know, what I like to do with Foo Barbell is I like to take all that information in and be able to disseminate it to my audience in a way that is free of any judgment. Like, hey, here's all these different ways that you can do things. And, uh, you know, even though we are but we aren't special unique flowers, try it out. You might get lost along the way, but it's going to be a fun journey. That's what right. I did. And at least you'll be a really buff flower. You're, you're going to be a buff, beautiful flower. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So <laughs> let's say you had somebody new. Walk me through, uh, if you can average it out, like what would it look like if a new person, let's say it was me, right, but I, I had no experience with barbells before, or I did, but, you know, not not in the way that your, that your experience uh, is right now, right? So I'm fairly new, and I come to you, and I'm like, all right, I got three weeks. What are we going to do? Okay, excellent. What's going on in the next three weeks? Excellent. So, you know, I actually wouldn't start them on a barbell right away. Here's the deal is I, I work with a lot of adults, you know, and I work with a lot of adult beginners who have a basically a training age of anywhere from like zero to maybe under a year, and uh, who knows what that athletic background looks like, right? So I find that what's missing for most of my adults is just a general sense of body awareness and body control. And so we start, before even talking about Olympic lifting, I need to teach them where their head is in relation to their butt, in relation to their feet, in relation to the ground, and how that all connects together. So we spend a lot of time you know, doing basic body awareness stuff, teaching them how to do a basic air squat. Hey, do you know, how, you know what your basic pushing mechanics looks like? Hey, do you understand what basic pulling mechanics looks like? And you know, once we establish like a very general body awareness, body control base, then we'll move to what I consider is the next element before you know even what weightlifters would consider the beginning, like a beginner's program, which is position training with a PVC pipe. And we drill position over and over and over again. And in fact, this is one thing that I, you know I like to play a lot of games because I get a lot of athletes that are traveling through. Let's face it, Nick. San Francisco is not a difficult place to say, hey, I'm going to go take a vacation. You know, twist <laughs> yeah, my arm. It's a horrible place, yeah. <laughs> if I brought this computer right outside to our deck base and pointed it out, you know, you would basically see the Golden Gate Bridge right there. I mean, this place is beautiful, and it's sunny, and we've got good food, and we've got a great community, right? So it's not hard to call this place a vacation spot. So we get a lot of athletes coming through on a, quite a frequent basis, and a lot of these athletes are what I would consider pretty seasoned uh, CrossFit athletes that have been involved in CrossFit for, you know, anywhere from one to three, four, five years sometimes. 
And one of the basic games I play with them, they're all like, hey, Diane, you know, I, I, need, I need help with my snatch. Can you fix my snatch? And I'm like, sure, I can absolutely try. And what they'll do is they'll be, they'll be like, well, you know, I feel like I should be able to snatch this number. And, you know, whatever number you have in your head, that's probably the number. Because nobody's going to come in, you know, snatch in, uh, you know, 80 kilos and be like, man, I really feel like I should just be able to hit 150. Right? It's always very... <laughs> There's always that one guy. Right? There, there's that one guy, right? But it's usually like, hey, my best snatch is 80 kilos. I just don't know why I can't hit like 83, 85. It's usually very modest in their mind. And I'm like, yeah, I feel like you should be able to hit that number too. I'll, you know, kind of do a basic parkour on their strength base. And I'm like, yeah, that all sounds reasonable. And I'm like, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to watch you warm up a little bit, right? And I just, you know, bye. I'll watch you warm up a little bit. I just want you to take the barbell, do your warm up, and then just start taking it up in a weight a little bit. And I just want to sit and I want to observe and I want to see what you're doing. And at some point, I'm going to stop you, pull you back, and we're going to talk some more. And so they'll start lifting, and I'm sitting back and watching. I'm not judging. Yeah, I'm judging. All right, so. <laughs> and they're lifting, and at some point, I'll just be like, okay, cool, let's break the bar down, and I'll take, have them take it to empty. Bar and I'll be like, here, look, I just want to, we're going to play a game. We're going to play Simon Says. And all I'm going to do is call out different positions in the poll, and you just have to show me what shape you should be in at that point. And so I'll be like, catch position. I'll be like, hip position, knee position, set up, knee, hip, knee, hip, set up. And I'll just like toy around with them for like a minute. And then at this point, usually their legs are burning, their grip is getting a little shot. I'll be like, okay, put the bar down. And, you know, I say this, like, let, let's not, I'm not a person of absolutes, so let's just be nice and give it 90%, right? So I'll say, like, 90% of the time what I'll notice is that these athletes come in and they'll show me a different position every time I call it out. Like, they're a little more forward with their shoulder at the hip, a little more behind. Their knees are a little more forward, a little behind. They're above their knee, they're below their knee, they're at their knee. They have really no idea where their knee is. Yeah. Right. And so then my next thing is I'm like, hey, look, you're showing me a different position every time. It shows me a lack of understanding. So when you're practicing your movement, how are you how are you practicing consistent rhythm every time? And they're like, ah, uh, well, when you put it that way, I guess I'm not. And so that's kind of the basis of where I start my programming and start my teaching with a lot of my athletes. It's just basic awareness, basic shapes basic positioning and we drill over and over and I do an insane amount of volume till they kind of think like oh my god you know how is this gonna make my snatch better but then invariably once we get them on a barbell they're moving smoother and more consistently from rep one to like rep however many that we do together so that's my first three weeks very roundabout but that's how we do things no, that, how, that, that's really cool I like that a lot I particularly like your calling out uh, stuff that sounds like a lot of fun I'm gonna have to steal that Simon says um, I love that it's my favorite yeah, it's good <laughs> That's, that's better than Marco Polo, which we yeah. that doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I thought I saw you, but I can't see you. Um, that's really cool. So let's take the same the same lifter. You had him for three weeks. They said yeah. San Francisco is amazing. I'm moving here. This is the greatest thing ever. Woo. And I'm going to stay here for a year. Right. So now what's going on? And, and let's keep the same uh, uh, demographic because you, know, you and I work with pretty similar demographics, you know, adults for the most part. Uh, and that's largely who, if you're watching this right now, I'm going to take a wild guess and say you're not eight years old. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and if that's you are, I'm sorry for my cussing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so take this, uh, this, this adult who has the good sense to move to San Francisco and work with you. Right. What the hell are they going to do for the rest of the year? All right. So now, you know, after I would say the first, let's, let's say four to eight weeks, you know, we do a lot of basic training. Uh -huh. They're starting to move a little better. Now it'll start looking a little more similar to what, you know, you and I would consider a, a beginner weightlifting program where we'll do, you know, we'll start them off at the hang and we'll go hang to a partial iteration, power catch, and then we'll, you know, after a while start stringing hang to a power catch into a complex of a squat. And it will start to look a little more similar. And after the first 12 weeks of that style of programming, they should have what I would consider a working snatch working clean and jerk where we can then start putting them into a formalized program to help kind of progress the movement and that's where Foo Barbell Club is still a rather young club we're maybe only a year and a half in so we're still experimenting a lot with the different components of how to program for these adults and what I find you know is as long as we are able to you know 
slowly increase the volume and the intensity and then pull back every you know four to six weeks depending on how we're pushing them and then climb them again like these guys have been seeing about anywhere from three to six percent increases on a monthly basis nice very nice yeah um, and uh, so presumably these are people who are also doing the CrossFit right no, actually, Foo Barbell Club is a oh. full-time weightlifting club. Okay, so, so the people who are with Foo Barbell are pretty much just into weightlifting. They're into weightlifting. They're into weightlifting full-time. They may still moonlight a little bit on the other side because we're within San Francisco CrossFit. So, you know, you'll show up on a Friday night where we have, like, a, what we call the Hero Wa. These are very intense workouts, and you'll catch them kind of moonlighting with the CrossFit community. I mean, we, we cross back and forth, but, yes, Foo Barbell Club itself is a club that meets, you know, full-time. Oh, okay. Wow, okay. Um, give me a rundown, like, your weekly – if you have an athlete who, let's say they've been with you for a little while, you know, this is not a rank beginner anymore. Right. Uh, how often per week are they training? What's, a, a, you know, just sort of an average weekly schedule look like for someone like this who's not preparing for a contest right this second? Right. So my club meets four days a week, and yeah. uh, they've been doing that for, you know, the last year, year and a half that we've been up and running. Um and we're on a four-day schedule, so we'll meet Tuesday through Friday, or I'm sorry, Tuesday through Thursday, and then Saturday. And it's, you know, not an ideal situation in my mind how I would like to partition the days. I'd probably like a, an extra day during the week to give them some break, but that's just kind of what our schedule at our with our fit club allows, right? So that's kind of what yeah, we have to go yeah. with. I think that's the reality of yeah. real people in the real world. <laughs> yeah, that's just kind of how it goes. So we make it work. I mean, it's not my ideal, but it's, you know, the best we can do with our situation. Yeah. Um, and then I have a five-day program for a lot of our coaches here. We actually have one, two, three coaches, including myself, that also run food barbell programming. So for those coaches, they're on a five-day schedule. And because we have access to the gym whenever – you know, we are more Monday through Thursday with the classic Friday rest day, meet Saturday, rest Sunday, so on and so forth. Right, right on. Uh, how do you intermix uh, the, the, you know, not necessarily connected problems of having a lot of technique to teach somebody and also the problem of trying to get somebody a lot stronger at the same time and then combining that with the fact that they're an adult, they have a limited amount of time, you have four days a week to work with them, there's only so many hours in the day. Right. How do you kind of shift that stuff around and, 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 and help ensure that people are making progress in both at the same time and getting where they want to go? Right. Well, that's a great question. And I, I guess in my mind, technique and you know strength development don't have to be separate things because we're constantly working technique. I mean, that's the majority of our week. We're within the you know 70 to 90% range. So it's not like we're, yeah. we're pushing intensity that hard on a regular basis, at least not with the way I program. Um, on Saturdays, we'll go heavier. Saturdays are a typical heavier day, so we'll go anything what I call a heavy single, double, or triple, where they're not really trying to max out per se, but they're really just trying to push the intensity while staying within limits of their technique and you know, kind of seeing what that stimulus will feel like for the day. And that could vary. I'm very big into kind of auto-adjusting workouts based on how the athlete is feeling for the day. Right. And then, um, you know, I'm also a pretty big believer of bodybuilding, and so there's you know two ways in which I do this, especially for my women coming in. I mean, I you know I don't like to generalize, but we're just not as strong as our counterparts, especially in our upper bodies, especially in our back, especially in our shoulders. And you know, let's face it, I you know I don't know what you see out there, but with the population that I work with, you know, people's trunks are their weakest link. Their low yeah. backs, you know, are not that strong. They have a really difficult time staying over the bar as they come through their pole, and they're always peeling behind a little too early. And so, yeah. you know, I'm a really big fan right. of bodybuilding for my athletes, and we'll do it two ways. One way is if they can get an extra day in, you know, I program an, you know, an optional Sunday, I call it, because my four-day guys rest on Monday. And so on Sunday, what I'll do is I'll do a bodybuilding day where I say just get in there and have fun with it, you know, work your asymmetries. Hey, you feel like your shoulders are a little small, get them beefed up a little more, you know. Uh, you know, do we do trunk work almost after every single session, some iteration of trunk. Um, yeah. And for my athletes that don't have that luxury of a Sunday, you know, I actually borrowed this one from the Chinese where, you know, after every single 
uh, workout, we'll pick two body parts and we'll go six sets to failure or six sets until something feels like it's going to fall off, basically. Awesome. I like the sound of that. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that's just kind yeah. of in a nutshell, right there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really good. I especially like that focus on, uh, you know, what's going on in your midsection and bodybuilding work. It's, I sometimes forget, you know, because I my my background was, you know, I started lifting when I was fourteen, you know, and oh, awesome. I actually was a bodybuilder first, and then a power lifter, and then a weightlifter. So when I became, yeah. I got into weightlifting, I had, you know. A much different foundation than a lot of people and the first right. crop of people that I really got serious with they were kind of similar they'd been doing a lot of training so right. in my early days when I was coaching like I drastically underestimated how bad a lot of people who actually are athletes they are competing in sports you know we're not talking about like just regular people here right. you know, who don't even work out but we're talking about people who are like they maybe they'd even college sports you know right. and they're right, surprisingly right. unathletic yes yes and I agree that's shocking. That was something that it took me a couple of years to really come to terms with that. Right. How bad off these people really were, and well, yeah, it's really mind, changed a lot how I train people. Yeah, in my mind, being an athlete and being athletic are you know they they really aren't the same thing. No, not at all. A lot, yeah, a lot of athletes that end up coming in, you'll you'll find just watching them move, you know. <laughs> Depend, you know, you're just able to glaringly see, you know, the the deficits within their system, and a lot of times it's it's really something as simple as they they you know spend a lot of time pursuing their athletics, but they let something as simple as you know trunk strength get fall behind. You know, either because they are a, they're quite skillful, they're able to get by on a very high skill level, but that very basic level of strength, you know, tends to be what I see is missing out of a lot of people coming through. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's that. Uh, um, I don't know. There does seem to be. I, I I blame a little bit of it on um, the the new push. This has been the last probably fifteen years, honestly, uh, or even twenty years, towards like getting kids to really focus in on a single sport really really quickly. And so you know, like you might be a basketball player or something, and you're really good at shooting free throws, but you actually can't even run without you yeah. know, risking a knee injury. Yeah. So they they these kids and you know I I certainly don't know enough about specific athletic specific sport to be able to speak to it to a very high level. But what I do feel and it's a gut feeling of mine that these young kids that end up specializing so young they develop all these asymmetries. They end yeah. up having a very high level of skill with a very low level of base strength and you know we the ones that can tolerate will end up you know pushing through and going somewhere but the majority of them end up breaking up at such a young age yeah right I mean the other idea of like you're 23 24 years old and you're basically careers over because yeah you're falling apart it's a, it's actually quite sad it's really pretty sad yeah uh, it's funny because I've actually I've always had some of my best uh, you know zero to sixty results the people who just get really fast seemingly from nowhere to being pretty awesome among people who are baby boomers generation. Oh really? Okay. And I, I, I don't. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that these are people who, they played outside a lot and just did random shit, and their PE classes were very hard when they were kids. <laughs> okay. They then spent 25 years and didn't do shit. Right, and, right. And then when they're 45, 50 years old, they jump back into it, and they're like, I want to learn how to do weightlifting. Kind of out of nowhere, right? Uh huh. And interestingly enough, they actually come. They get pretty good pretty fast. It's really weird, and I think that it's you know there's something about that that if you grew up really physically active and getting a broad, you know, base of strength yes. and learning that what you said earlier that total yes. lack of body control which a lot of people have, um, I mean it's really bad actually. I, I I find like the the worst body control issues I find in people who are under forty. Yeah, I feel that too. You know, because we're getting a lot of people that you know come in, and I, again, I don't you know know what population you see, but the population that we come across quite often is it used to be people that were already a little more physically fit, physically geared, would come in and gravitate towards wanting to learn Olympic lifting, wanting to do CrossFit. Like these were people yeah. looking for that supplemental programming, but they were already a little stronger, a little more inclined, right? But these days, it's like, oh, hey, you know, um, I saw this thing called CrossFit on TV, and, uh, you know, I just figured <laughs> I need to get in shape, and, um, you know, never worked out in my life, but 
hitting late thirties. I think I should start now. And I'm like, great, let's do this. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. I, I agree. I think the popularization of just all types of I don't even know to call it like raw gym training. Right. Uh, of all kinds at this point is getting way beyond the bounds of what it's ever been. And of course that means there's a larger influx of people who are not really very athletic yet. Right. Who are interested in it. I think this is obviously this is a good thing. It just means that uh, it's now contingent upon, you know, us to right. somehow take people who normally would have gone into like you know, a normal fitness class or a step aerobics class. Right. And now they're like, no, I want to actually compete in weightlifting. Right. And, and I actually, you know, what I find from that population coming in is it's challenged me as a coach in a way that's forced me to kind of rethink traditional progressions, traditional models and methods of teaching, which is kind of where I came up with the regression of what we already feel is basic and actually taking that even a step further back. And by doing these regressions of our current progressions that are in place, I found that we've I've been able to take these adults from zero to sixty, zero to something, a lot faster than more conventional models. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think that uh, even with people who are otherwise athletic, like what you said before about they might have like a high level of skill in an area, but they're not generally athletic. I, I call that like like the Swiss cheese knowledge problem, you know, where like you look like a block of cheese, but you have a whole lot of holes in you, right? I like that. I like that. You really <laughs> see the analogies, Nick. I, I love it. <laughs> I really do appreciate it. <laughs> and I think a lot of our job sometimes is like, well, if, if you start, if you, you have two approaches there. Like one is, well, I'm just going to try to fill up your holes, right? But then I have to like hunt for holes all the time. I'm probably going to miss a bunch. Whereas instead, if you say, forget it, man, we're just going to throw this block away, and we're going to start from scratch, and we're right. just going to work you up like you don't know a damn thing, Right. I, I like think that. more often than not, you actually come away better off with somebody. Absolutely. Can't agree more. So if you're an athlete and you're watching this right now, start from scratch. <laughs> just open your mind, blank slate, learn, Right. and yeah, I totally agree. Zen mind, beginner's mind, as they say. Right. Um, so speaking of athletes, uh, as we are... What is, if you can narrow it down to one or two, maybe three key things, what are those things that you look for most in an athlete? I mean, if you could just recruit athletes off the street, what are the things that you would want the most out of somebody coming in? Uh, they could be physical, they could be emotional, they could be intellectual, it doesn't really matter. Uh, is there a collection of things there that you would really like to see uh, uh, an athlete to, to embody in some capacity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, number one, I think, is just personality, their attitude, you know, how they approach things. You know, I've worked with people who are highly talented but under-motivated or even a little bit defeatist in their attitude, and it makes it actually really hard to penetrate and help them out. You know, whereas I've worked with, I work with, a lot of athletes who, you know, maybe aren't quite as physically talented, but, you know, man, it's like, they are very mighty in their mind and you know they are able to push and see progress to their physical genetic potential a lot faster just because they have they know how to dig deep they know how to drive you know and also when I see athletes that have that you know compensity is I almost sometimes feel it, it really is the under talented ones that end up really trying to fight the hardest you can't help but want to help them and be by their side and respect that level of attitude and work ethic. So I feel like that's number one for me. And number two is because of you know the community that I work with, because CrossFit and weightlifting can both be seen as sport, right? Um, you know, I, I like a sense of balance in everything that I do. So definitely, you know, having that attitude of wanting to go get and work hard is one, but also having the ability to pull back and take a step back from the experience and look at it from a lighter sense and find balance and have some fun with what it is you're doing. Because, you know, I say this to, you know, my the people that I come across is I'm like, I hate to burst your bubble, but you and I are never going to get paid to, you know, participate in this sport. Like, have some fun with it. Because if yeah. you're not having fun, what are you doing? Because a full-time weightlifter, 
a full time can spend anywhere upwards of 15 to 20, if you want to include recovery time, 25 hours of their week, you know, dedicated to this this one activity. And if you're not having fun, what are you doing? You yeah. know? Right. Um, and the third one is obviously just the propensity to move, just having that, you know, physical body awareness, knowing, you know, where your head is in relation to your butt, in relation to your feet, in relation to the ground, and how that all connects together. If I can have that, you know, I can build the strength, I can build the technique. It makes yeah. everyone's life a lot easier. So those would be my three. Those are really order. good. Yeah, those are really good. And uh, again, if you're watching this, take that shit seriously. Most importantly, I'm going to, her number one is absolutely my number one also. Like that attitude, that is huge. There's nothing worse than somebody who walks in the door who just drags down the environment. Right. Because they've got such a negative feeling about themselves. Right. The whole time. And Thankfully, that can be trained out of yourself. You can, in fact, do that. Uh, just like any other kind of training, you can become a more positive person, and it doesn't make you wimpy. It makes you better. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I agree. <laughs> there is a weird thing. I think there's like this. There's like there's the one kind of personality. It's like the bro personality, which is really annoying, right? But there's that other one, which is it's almost just as bad as a bro. It's like that. It is that's a fetist person. That person who just thinks. It's an well, energy. Yeah, it's amazing, and they're like the anti-bro, but in the worst possible way. Right, it's the energy, and you know, energy in a small environment like a club is very infectious. Oh my god! You, know, yeah. you get you get one person that's a little bit droopy, a little bit down, a little bit defeatist about how they approach things, and all all of a sudden you see the, everybody else not lifting as well, and the environment starts to spiral really quickly. Whereas if you you know, I all the out of all the clubs that I've hung out with, there's always I really feel all clubs should have women. <laughs> yeah. Because I've hung out in, in clubs, and again, I'm generalizing, so sorry guys that are out there, but you know, I sometimes find when it's like all guys, it can be a little heavy. You know, like, yeah. you know, they're all very focused, they're all very serious about their lifting, and uh, you know, th there's very little chatter going on, which I understand at certain times, you, you, you just gotta put your nose down and get to work. But the rest of the time when you're in practice, and for me, you know, I don't really see it as training. I always see it more as like practice. Yeah. You know, you, you want to have some, you want to have some lightness in there. And so I feel like the clubs I've been to, where there've been, you know, a handful or a group of female lifters or women lifters, they, they kind of help balance things out and keep it light. And they're fun and they're laughing and they're smiling, and they're still taking their workouts very seriously. But it just kind of brings a little balance of energy to the environment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I uh, <laughs> at the risk of sounding sexist, I'm going to agree with you and say I do actually think males lean towards this problem more often of uh, a combination of being overly pouty about things that don't go right <laughs> and then getting oddly pissed off at really stupid shit. <laughs> uh, now, there's some of you ladies out there have the same problem. Some of you work with me. I know you know what you're talking about. <laughs> But I have I, I completely agree. I actually think that especially it's the same it's the same problem uh, the pouty problem, but uh, males will often cover it up by just looking angry, right? So like they miss right. a lift, right? And then they get all pissed off and they like slam out the door or whatever right. else, right? Which is really just another way of like being a giant pansy ass, right? Uh, and 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 trying to make it look like you're tough, right? Like that high school right. high school bully kid. Uh, and that's one of those issues where I think, especially males, they have this problem where they, although I've had a couple women who had the same problem, uh, males will very often have this issue where they believe with every ounce of their being that if they don't have some level of anger going on, they're not going to be as strong, they're not going to be as good at what it is they're doing, especially in strength sports. It was really bad when I was in powerlifting. Uh, weightlifting is a little less so, but powerlifting, man. Uh, and... I keep trying to teach people this difference. There's a huge difference between these two A words. One is anger, and the other is aggression. Right. They're not the same I thing. I agree. You know, a lion is not angry when it's taking down its prey. Right. It's aggressive as hell. That's for damn sure. But that lioness who's just ripping that, you know, poor caribou down. <laughs> I mean, the I agree. caribou's probably angry, but the the, the lion isn't. And to understand that difference is the difference between somebody who's going to be a great athlete and somebody who's going to be okay because they have good genetics and all that shit, but they're never going to be great. Yeah. You know, I think it's really interesting that you made that point because, you know, powerlifting, 
and Olympic lifting, even though they have they they have similar threads, they're very different sports. Yeah. And the one thing that I think is very difficult, and it takes uh, you know years to develop this level of physical intelligence, is that in Olympic lifting you don't need that level of stiffness and stimulation to be able to move the load. You actually need again. It's like I'm really big on balance and everything. And you need this balance of, you know, how how much tension do you need in your body to maintain that structural support, and how relaxed can you be so you can allow your muscles to come through and express this power and speed, right? And it's that fine balance that, you know, in the beginning people have a really hard time grasping onto. So that's why we see our beginners when they lift, they look the movement looks very hesitant and very segmented, and they do this like, you know, stand up zombie arm pull and everything looks like one, two, three, four and super choppy and connected and it's until they can realize how to find this balance within themselves that they can start easing into their lift and suddenly things start to become a lot more connected and fluid and you know artistic and beautiful right 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 yeah you don't want to snatch like C-3PO that's not yeah <laughs> Completely agree, and that and that I find takes people a long time to understand because they think like, oh man, I'm you know about to get on this barbell and clean it or snatch it, and you know for them it's you know a relative to a relatively challenging weight, and as it nears like whatever maximal they are physically capable of, they feel they need to you know generate more stiffness or generate more tension yeah. or generate more, and a lot of times no, you just need to maintain enough and start moving, right? right. Right. Yeah, it's a. I think it's a big shift. I, I have very rarely, as a couple of very notable exceptions, but uh, very rarely had success translating a power lifter into a good weightlifter. Yeah, they're too. Uh, they're, they're very stiff movers. Yeah, it's really tough. Same thing with like endurance athletes. You know, like a marathon runner or a, a triathlete or someone like that. Same. They're, they're, I almost think of them as being almost identical to a power lifter, just on opposite ends of the spectrum, but they're yeah, on extreme ends of athleticism where you really yes. only need one thing. Yes, you need I can see like that. an intensity of a type right. with this one physical skill. Right. And every single other sport requires a combination of skills used in conjunction together. But these really super extreme sports, like either you're all endurance or you're all strength. Uh, they don't actually. They don't require all that much of anything else. Whereas weightlifting is starting to push more towards like a track and field sport. Right, I agree. And so, in those kinds of a sports, well, you need you need strength and you need you know uh, uh, you know quickness and you need all these other kinds of things. But you will, what you really need is you need to be able to put them together in the right way and at the right, right times and all yes. that other stuff. And that's a lot harder to do. Um, for your brain. It's not that it's, you know, I mean, you know, the extreme endurance is just as hard to do, but it's all packaged into one exact small area, right? Yeah. And so you can get away with less endurance maybe to be a soccer player. <laughs> right. But you have to do other things. Right. All of a sudden. Right. I, I like um, the way you put that. I, li I like it. Like comparing Olympic lifting to track and field. I've never thought about it that way, but it, the analogy makes perfect sense. I like it. I've almost always thought too, like weightlifting would be way more popular if we just made it a track and field sport. Oh, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. We'll just do it outside. Fuck absolutely, it. <laughs> absolutely. I think that. I mean, we in San Francisco. I mean, again, I don't know how it operates everywhere else, but in San Francisco, a couple times a year, we have events where we can have it in an outdoor pavilion, and it is. It's fun. It's more exciting. Yeah. People like to come by. There's a barbecue going on. Like, totally. You know, it's it's actually it's it to me are some of my favorite events throughout the year. Yeah, and track and field athletes take to weightlifting really well. Uh, oh, yeah. The explosiveness. I, I've had great success. I've had three <laughs> different people who are pole vaulters. i got one right now uh -huh. uh, who translated themselves into weightlifters. And it, uh, I like to use pole vaulting analogies a lot probably because I keep running into them. But uh, it's amazing how quick they pick these things up and how not crazy a snatch seems. Right. To someone who's done this stuff. You know, to everybody else, you know, a snatch seems outlandish. Right. As a thing to do with yourself. But to someone who flips themselves up into the air that high and then falls down on purpose. Right. <laughs> like a snatch isn't particularly scary. Yeah, yeah. I can definitely see that. You know, the track and field athletes that, you know, I've come across in my in my history, you know, I find them to be extremely fast, very powerful. 
And it's almost like for them, getting that weight hauling isn't the issue, is learning how to temper that so they can maintain control over the system a yeah. lot of times. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. I have really good luck with uh, martial artists and dancers, too. Uh, believe it or not, I had a ballerina. Gymnast. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, these are these are these are these are places where you have to learn all that body control. Well, that's yeah, that's what I was saying. Is like anybody that comes in with some level or some base of body awareness, body control, those athletes are so much easier and they develop so much faster because you need to learn how to manipulate your body before yeah. you can manipulate an external object, right? Okay. And not the other way around. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Unless, of course, you're using, uh, you know, your mind to move it. You know, that's oh, that's a different. I think I have a game at home where you you attach this thing on your brain and you're trying to move a ball. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so speaking of using your mind, uh, you uh, uh, you went crazy and you decided to do the 21 day squat challenge with some of your folk. Uh, which oh yeah, that was great. Some, some nut jobs idea, 21 day squat challenge. Yeah, that guy is. Uh, so tell me a little bit yeah, about. I never came up with that one. Kind of crazy. Tell me about what happened there with the 21 Day Squat Challenge, right. and uh, for people who don't know much about it, uh, what it is and what you did with it, because everybody who goes through it kind of does it in your own unique way. Right. Um, it was I actually run it twice with my team now. The first time I ran it was probably. Um, you know, I, when did we, I think I ran into you at the Arnold's, it wasn't last year, it was the year before, right? Yeah. Was it Arnold's the year before? Yes. So, you know, when we came across each other at the Arnold's the year before, uh, my team, you know, a couple of my athletes were there, they competed, and, you know, the one thing that I felt was really glaring in everyone's kind of base strength was, hey, I feel like our legs need to get a little bit stronger. And so I've been following some of your information, you know, watching your YouTube videos. Very nice job. I don't know how you hold the camera that still as you walk <laughs> and talk to the camera, life. but I was like, that's impressive. Like, it's, it's amazing because you're not bobbling around. I'm not getting motion sickness. Like, it's really like, good job, Nick. I'm really impressed. Um, so I was watching some of your information, then I came across your 21-day squat challenge. And... You know, this is kind of always whether to the better or the worse of me, how I think of things is when I see things as a challenge, when I see things that are difficult, um, or sometimes if it's even seemingly impossible, uh, my attitude is always like, okay, why not? <laughs> you know, let's give it a try. What's the worst that can happen? So when I read about your 21-day squat challenge, I was really intrigued because it sounded impossible, and it sounded like, something that I you know we've I've never clearly done before you know before, but yet you know you were you know making pretty big claims of seeing gains with the people that you've worked with and I'm like it's 21 days what have we got to lose you know the worst that happens is our legs fall off that's fine we don't need those and so I proposed it to my team and they're like yeah let's <laughs> you don't need legs um, so I proposed it to my team and I'm like hey guys you know what do you think about this and they're like, uh, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, I'm absolutely serious. And you know what? And I'll do it with you guys. And so it was a group of maybe four of us. And for 21 days, uh, the way I just basically alternated back squat, front squat on a daily basis. And maybe every other week, I would try to uh, vary the volume. So if we did more front squatting on one week, we would do a little more back squatting in the week after, and then so on and so forth through the 21 days. Um, three days a week, we ran it up uh, to volume, so I picked arbitrary three days, gave, gave enough space in between, and we did volume, uh, I think the prescription was triples, small jumps up to a max, that's where we got our foundation, and then after we found that, then we uh, did two back offsets at 50% for sets of five for speed, right? Sounds about right? Yep. Uh, we did that three days a week for 21 days, and, you know, for the first... I would say seven to eight days. It was it was a little tough. It was a little rough. You know, we we were all like, mm, I don't know. Our numbers weren't going up. In fact, they were going down. You know, on our heavy singles because you know the way we ran it was we weren't allowed to grind any reps. So as as soon yeah. as our speed started to slow down, as soon as we started to grind a little bit, we pulled but we pulled off and we called it our heavy single for the day, right? And so our numbers were going down. We're like, mm, I don't know if this is working. And then it was kind of the magical, I would say, like, 10th day, 11th day in 
that uh, everyone just suddenly started to turn around and spike. And in fact, one of my girls uh, set a 15-pound PR on her 10th day in, and on day 11, on her uh, squat again, she set another 10 pounds, and on the third day, she built another five. Oh, and then it, it kind of started to plateau. I know, right? One of one of my girls responds really well to volume, so this is the one that responds terribly well to volume. Like, the more volume I can put in her, the more she'll yeah. respond. She's a little atypical. She's extreme on the bell curve for the most of my athletes. Um, but so she saw, you know, over the course of the 21 days, you know, I think... I would say upwards of 40 pound increase between her front and back squat, which is pretty spectacular. That's pretty um, good. Another one of my girls, about 30, I think I personally experienced about 20, 25. I was a little, you know, more high level with my squatting than these guys, but that was pretty good for somebody who squats regularly. Yeah. Uh, That's great. My uh, my guy, same thing, about 20 pounds ish. And so, you know, after these 21 days, I remember walking in on the 21st day. It was a Sunday. Um, and I will say that we were all really tired of seeing each other. Because <laughs> we had literally seen each other for 21 days straight at this point. And the last thing we wanted to do on a Sunday morning in San Francisco, when it's sunny, was come in and hit our squats. Like, we all wanted to be, you know, at brunch with a mimosa in our hands. So... Uh, but we enjoyed it. We all saw really great gains, and afterwards, I, you know, I want to say, which is why it led me to email you like a year and a half later because we ran it a second time. Um, is like, hey, you know, like now we, we saw these gains really quickly. It almost like, it was an inflation, like extreme inflation. And a lot of times, what I find with things that are, you know, extremely, you know, this isn't artificial, of course, but extremely inflated really quick, they also tend to disappear really fast, right? Right. So, yeah. You know, which is why kind of a year and a half later led me to email you like, hey, you know, do you see these gains keep? It's not like we're going to stop squatting, but we're certainly not going to continue squatting at this level, at this intensity, at this frequency. Like we're definitely going to pull back on the frequency of squats to maybe two or three days a week because we're going to move on to other things. But yeah, we love the program. I ran it again recently with my full barbell team, the actual athletes, and you know, very or I'm sorry, not I'm sorry, not the 21 day squat challenge. Um, we ran uh, your nemesis. Uh, is it called the nemesis program where they yeah. do the the heavy single with the uh, triple volume with the speed back off? I ran that for a cycle with my athletes, and you know, even just doing that about two three days a week, they saw pretty good improvement over the course of a month as well. That's good. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, no, that's really good. I like the. Uh, the question about that, um, the drop-off potential, right. because I think, you know, you're certainly in a unique case where you're dealing with people who are part of a dedicated weightlifting team. Obviously, you guys are going to keep squatting and you're going to keep working hard at that. Uh, so that's good, you know. That that's the main thing, obviously, for anybody who's going to be able to keep gains like this. Uh, I do think for anyone listening in, there's a lot of people who will run this who are not like that. They're like maybe doing just CrossFit and often doing just strictly wads most of the time. Then they spend three weeks doing this, get good gains on the squat, go back to uh, just doing wads. In other words, maybe honestly only squatting once or twice a week, depending right. on the gym you're in. Because some, some CrossFit clubs are very different than others in terms of how they program their wads, and some just don't have a lot of squats. Right. And so for those athletes... Is, how do you, you know, for those athletes, what would you say the the kind of the level of drop off would be? Oh, I, w I would argue that if you're not, if you're in a CrossFit club that is kind of leaning towards that endurancey end of the wad spectrum, where it's like 45 minute, one hour wads of lots of, you know, pretty high repetition stuff and not a lot of squatting, I think you're rather boned actually. Right. I think it could you could drop off almost completely. Right. Uh, which is very similar to the reason why a lot of the uh, well-designed strength and conditioning programs for athletes who are endurance athletes never have you stop doing strength training even during the middle of the season. I uh, absolutely agree. Because it's too easy to lose your strength, and it's it's hard to build it, it's hard to maintain it, and it's really easy to lose. It's really the worst of all worlds. <laughs> uh, so well, that, that's a big one. I think for, if you're in a serious strength training program and you're a strength athlete, you're actually going to do really well. Those people have almost – they don't have any drop-off. 
know? It's just they might plateau after that if they decide not to keep squatting that way. Right. Uh, but very little actual drop off if there is any. Um, yeah, that that's good news. It, it, the bad news though, I, I you know I do like to tell you the honest truth. The bad news is is you want to keep big squat gains, you have to squat all the time. Yeah. And so, so <laughs> you know, because of the nature of our club, like I want to run your 21 days again with my entire club athlete, my entire group. Um, I just have to figure out logistically how I can make that work for them, given that we need four days a week, given that I personally don't want to come in <laughs> seven days for 21 days. So there's these little variables that, you know, I want to play around with. But, you know, I am interested in running that program. And what I really find that I enjoyed the way I see that 21 days working is it's a great launching point for a lot of people who want to get their leg strength up, get it up quickly. It's, you know, 21 days of investment for a very significant return, you know, right. in such a short amount of time. And then from there, once you have this increased capacity, then it's up to you how yeah. what direction you want to take it. Um, I would almost use that 21 days as a starting point into like a kind of a prereq into another cycle. Yeah. Right? Get your leg strength up, develop some new numbers, and then go into more of a long term, let's say, you know, seven to 12 week, seven week squat cycle where you're no longer squatting every day. Now you can peel it back to two, three days a week. It's probably more like three days a week if you're in a cycle. And then, you know, slowly start to kind of see etch away at the at the smaller returns because you're not going to be seeing you know 20 to 40 pound gains every time right right, right. So, that doesn't actually work in the real I, I wish it worked that way but yeah it doesn't yeah. really work that way so now yeah. now you can go into something a little bit longer term but then you can also release some bandwidth so you can do other things like snatch and clean a jerk right yeah yeah exactly and that that's basically how we usually use it in our own gym we have 21 day squat challenge style beginning for somebody, even with people who are basically ranked beginners, I mean, as long as you can squat safely and whatever else, then we'll run it a few times over until you're at the point where we're not just doing it as like, well, you're working your technique every day for 21 days, right? right? <laughs> That's one option. Uh, but once we've gotten to that point where you know, we really used it as a boot camp for how to be intense, how to deal with volume, how to deal with uh, commitment and all these other things, once you've gotten through all of that stuff, the actual seven day part isn't really that important. Yeah. Uh, you know, I make it 21 days and literal 21 days, partly for what you just said earlier, where it makes it more fun. It's like a challenge, it's a game. Right. Uh, you play this game for 21 days and you automatically win. It's just pass fail if you just squat yeah. it every day. Yes. You don't have to even gain any weight on your squat. Hell, your squat can go down, it doesn't matter. Right. The point is, is that you did it and you did something you didn't think you could do. Right. And now you did. And now, like you said, you can go into other programs. I mean, like anybody else, most of our lifters don't squat more than four or five times a week, uh, you know, except for a couple of crazy crazy folk. Uh, that's just not even tenable for most people in the real world, you know, to, to even be able to pull off. And yet squat gains can still be great. The seven-day part is much more about the, like right the fun aspect, honestly, and just the challenge and just proving to yourself you can do something you didn't think you could What I like about the seven days is, you know, for the athletes willing to participate in the challenge, you know, as a coach, it also shows you their level of commitment yes. to the sport or to the activity. Yes. Right? You're not going to come in seven days a week and, you know, put a heavy bar on your body and take it up to a perceived you know, single for the day, then spend another 45 minutes, an hour, building up to volume three days a week if you're not committed to what it is you're doing. So from a coach, it also just shows you, you know, that, that attitude, that level of commitment, that level, you know, what, how are they going to fare when, you know, the cycle gets a little rough and the intensity builds and they're a little fatigued, but they got to keep pushing, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and that, that's a big one. I, I like the litmus test aspect. You know, oh, earlier you talked about the attitude issue. You can learn a lot about someone's attitude in 21 days of constant yep. squatting. Yeah. If they can deal with the fact that, like you said, you know, your lifters, this is very common, by the way, if you're watching this and you haven't tried a 21-day squat challenge yet, it's extremely common for the first week or two for your lift to go down, not up. Yep. You haven't actually adapted to it yet. Right. And your body's still... It's dealing with this accumulation of stress, and it doesn't know how to what to deal with it yet. How to deal with it yet? It's right. very similar, like if you started a diet, right? Anybody right. who's ever done intermittent fasting before? You know, I've gone through long periods of time where I only ate one meal a day, 
uh, partly just for the same aspect. Impressive. <laughs> challenge, right? Like, uh -huh. for the first week, it sucks. Your body's right. telling you, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry. And then at some point right. or another, your body goes, I guess I'm not going to get food in the morning. Right, and then you adjust. <laughs> right. Yes. But it takes a while. It takes a while. Right. Yeah, I found that, like I said, it was like the 10th, 11th day, like 9 to 11, let's say, within that ballpark, that people suddenly started to turn around and spike. Like it went from we couldn't even hit close to our actual maxes to now we're hitting our max, it's fast, it's fluid, and we're able to make those extra climbs. I thought that was a really cool to experience. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go back to this balance idea. I'm also a big fan of balance, which uh, I always like to say is the opposite of like middle of the road stuff, right? Like right. Right. <laughs> there, there, there's like being in the middle of something and then right. there's actually balancing two extremes, right? Yes, correct. So given that, we've done a whole lot of talking about uh, things related to a gym. What do you have, what, what are other things you're really interested in? What are things that just that move you, that get you grooving, that get you going, that actually have nothing to do with the barbell? Well, you know, this might sound a little obvious, but family is really important to me. Um, you know, my I like spending time with my family. I really like being around people and being around friends. Um, I am an avid collector of uh, body art, and so you know, almost on a gosh, there was a period where I would go once a week, and you know, the way my artist would have it set up because I have an entire leg sleeve done. And, uh, you know, it's color, and so the way color takes in the skin, it, it takes more sessions, it takes more time, yeah, right? Yeah. And so the way my artist would have it set up, I'd come in to his studio, he'd have, a, like, a VCR set up, and uh, once a week for four hours for, I think, an entire eight-month span, I'd go in, and he'd basically work on me while I, you know, got caught up on all the latest movies that were happening. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't, again, you know, we keep talking about balance, right? And so I don't plan on becoming, like, neck to foot 100% ink. I, I like, you know, the balance of, you know, negative space to, you know, the, the, the pieces on my body that I've covered. So, you know, I, I am kind of, I need to space my time out <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Yeah. But I still, you know, I still go almost on a monthly basis to get something done, and I love it, and I think it's fascinating, and, uh, you know, I think it's beautiful, and, you know, don't ask me if anything has meaning, because it really doesn't. I just, I enjoy how it looks. Um, yeah. And, no, you got some good ones. I'm a, as a Portland native, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I definitely have an appreciation for really cool tattoos, and you definitely got some. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Um, you know, getting around and traveling and meeting other people, I'm really, I get really energized by, you know, being around folks. And so, you know, being involved in CrossFit and having this opportunity to straddle kind of two worlds and talk to both communities, you know, allows me to, you know, get around the United States and, you know, do what I love doing and sharing what it is I know. And, you know, I've been very fortunate, I feel, in the sense that the way in which I deliver information, people have, you know, kind of bonded to it and they enjoyed it so you know I mean that's kind of me in a nutshell in terms of things I like to do in in the gym out of the gym that's awesome before we sign off I want to go through and um, ask you about your bits of advice for three different groups of people the first one being athletes the next one's coaches on the subject of coaching in the gym and the other one would be professional coaches like on the subject of just like what it means to have to do this as a living okay uh, there's a lot of people who watch this actually are coaches. Um, it's always good to hear, you know, how other coaches are doing things and all of that. So the first one is, is what is one piece or a bunch of pieces of advice that you would give to any athlete out there who's listening to this right now? Any athlete that's listening to this right now. Well, I'm always big on taking action. So, uh, you know, hopefully in reading or watching this interview, listening to this interview, you picked up some good information that you're like, oh, hey, it's kind of like an epiphany. I've never thought of things that way. I've never heard of that concept before. And, uh, you know, take it and on your very next practice session, apply it, right? Apply it right away. Take action. Use it. Um, and instead of chasing the number, which I think sometimes can get inside an athlete's head a little bit, you know, chase chase movement, you know, practice. Instead of training, it's practice, you know, always chase quality, always chase movement, 
and if you understand your positions and you have movement and you then layer on the speed, the load is simply an expression of the rest of the pieces. Yeah, that's great. I really like that. Uh, so how about to a coach listening uh, on the subject of coaching athletes? On the subject of coaching athletes, um, be patient and understand that as adults, you know, chances are you're working with adults coming into this activity that they're not going to get it right away and they're probably not even going to get it in the first month and you know the it's it's tempting as a coach to want to see progress in terms of again weight lifted on the bar you want them to PR and they will at some point start but don't rush them there and be okay with holding them back a little bit yeah. because you're going to allow them to move faster by forcing them to move a little slower right yeah, that's that's really good advice. I think that that's yeah. really, especially when you're first starting out in coaching, is was most certainly true for me. Uh, you end up wanting to rush people through yeah. because you have expectations for what you want them to do right. that may not be in line with where they can be at this moment. Yeah, especially then, for adults, kids, different story. Adults, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I and it, there was a lot of information I think here that you gave about uh, ways to approach training adults, which I think is very applicable to anybody who's, who's dealing with adults. And I would say, you know, when I say adult, I mean a biological adult, right? Like 14 yeah, and An actual adult, adult, yes. An yeah. actual adult. Like this really applies to just about everybody who's hit puberty at this point. Right. Yeah, this is really, that's really good. So finally, I do want to uh, uh, have you just kind of weigh in a little bit. If you have like a, a piece of advice for people who want to do this professionally, they don't, they don't want to you know, just want to do it on the side and have another job or whatever else, but they actually want to try to make a career of this, which, you know, 30 years ago, that wasn't even an option, right? right? And we live in a very different world where, where this is something that can actually be done, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy. Right. So what would you tell somebody who was looking into that? Uh, to become a professional CrossFit weightlifting coach? Both. Uh, anything. I mean, anything that's kind of in that, that world, you know. Okay. Um, what I would say is get your hands on as much information as you can. Um, it's very tempting in the beginning to hang on to one school of thought or learn one school of thought and be like, this is what my coach taught me and I don't want to hear what you have to say yeah. because this is what my coach says, this is what I learned, this is what I know. And you, you have to, when you're first learning and you actually don't see the light, you don't see everything very clearly, you need to hang on to something to feel grounded and anchored. But, you know, my advice to those coaches is like, pull the anchor out, let yourself go, get your hands on as much information as you can, get your hands on as much um, material as you can, and in the beginning you'll feel very lost, you'll feel conflicted, somebody will say something, somebody will say another thing, and you don't know how to tie the two together. But at some point during this journey that you're on, you know, the, the confusion will start to part and you'll be able to poke your head above water and suddenly you'll be able to make some decisions for yourself. Those decisions that you can make for yourself, that then you can start creating something that's unique for you that will allow you to take your craft and take your skill and be able to apply it to the people that you work with. And once people, once people kind of experience, you know, that level of view, they realize, oh, this isn't just another person teaching me something. This person really has something different to offer. And, you know, that your, your I don't want to say credibility, but then, you know, your uh, name as a coach will start to kind of spread a little bit more, and then people will start coming to you because you've created something special. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. That's that's really great advice. I particularly like this emphasis on trying to educate yourself in a real way, just the knowledge base as much as you can, as broadly as you can, and thinking outside the box. I think that that's really hard in the beginning. I I mean, I went through a lot of years where I mean, it's funny. You know, if you look back on how I thought, say a decade ago, it was probably the exact opposite of what I think now. Right. In almost every way. Right. You know, like I, 
I would I would I just have a horrible raging argument probably with my old self. Right. And that's natural. I think anybody who's gone through any long term evolution and in, in, in any field, coaching being one of them, is gonna certainly do that. But it's only possible if you allow yourself to open yourself up, like you said, and let in new information that you otherwise might have just rejected offhand, just immediately rejected. Right. You know, that's not coming from the channel I'm comfortable with. So therefore, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen because otherwise I'll get confused. It might shatter my foundation, and then oh my God, what if I don't know anything? You know, what would then? <laughs> you know, so I, I get that because I feel you know coaches all go through that on some level, and you don't get to evolve or become a better version of yourself, a better version, um, you know, the the coach that you would to become should you not be able to let some of your walls down and let some of you what, what you think you know you know aside so you can let in more information that's fantastic I love it well this was great this is a fantastic interview and I, I there really is a lot here and um, so if you're if you're watching this I say uh, click back to the beginning and watch it again take notes <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Nick it's been a lot of fun and yeah, I really glad we, you know we got to hang out and talk and you know I, I love the work that you do so thank I you. hope you keep it up and I don't know if you plan on being at nationals or whatever but you know maybe we can hang out and Chat some more. Yes, absolutely. Now, before we take off, I, I want you to tell everyone where they can find you online. Okay. Um, you can find me at foobarbell.com. That's my website. You can also follow me on social media where I tend to be very active. Uh, Foo Barbell on Facebook, Diane Foo on Instagram, and also Diane Foo on Twitter. Although, hey, guys, I really don't know what I'm doing when I'm tweeting, so <laughs> cut me some slack out there. I just throw throw things out there, you know, I cast it out, and I don't know what else to do with it. So tweeting is a, a new phenomenon to me, but everything else I'm pretty savvy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. And I'll make sure that uh, when I post this up on the Weightlifting Academy page, I've got her uh, links there to, to uh, check out her stuff and, and follow along with what she's doing and, and learn from her. And if you're ever in San Francisco, you know where to go. Apparently it's nice. You can check out the Golden Gate Bridge right when you're there. It's, it's good. Right out the door. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to click this big old red button here, and apparently that's going to mean uh, it's over. And Perfect. Again, thank you, Diane. That was awesome. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Nick. I enjoyed and, it. Uh, I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you. <laughs>